thank you everyone for coming. Uh, what we've done is we've put together a, a presentation on all the most frequently asked questions that we've heard over the last couple months while we've been doing stem cell therapies. And I'm trying to address most of them in this presentation. And then on top of that, a lot of people kept coming in also asking, well, what else are stem cells good for? What else, what other conditions could we use to treat uh, with stem cells? So I focused the second half of the presentation on other conditions like specifically chronic diseases that I don't think a lot of people think about for stem cell therapy. So when I say chronic disease, it's a pretty big range of stuff, right? It's diseases that are typically three months or longer, right? They're long lasting in nature. So when we think about stem cells, I think a lot of people think, oh yeah, we can rebuild tissue, but they do so much more than that. And that's what I hope to show today. So first to begin with, who can tell me what stem cells are? Right? Well, who's heard of stem cells, right? So it's a hot topic, right? Everybody's heard about it, but it's kind of hard to know exactly what they are. So stem cells are the master cells because of their ability to regenerate. So at first, stem cells are the building blocks of all the organs, tissues, blood, and the immune system and can form a complete human baby. But after that, stem cells serve as an internal repair system for lost or damaged cells for each organ for the entire lifespan of a person. So these are known as adult stem cells. And to keep your pool of adult stem cells plentiful, your stem cells must also divide to make more stem cells. So the number of times a stem cell can divide or to make more stem cells is called self-renewal. And this is a little confusing because the earliest form of adult stem cells shows up in the placenta cord and cord blood, even though it's a newborn. And that's important because as stem cells age, their ability to self-renew declines rapidly. Placenta or cord stem cells can self-renew about 2 million times, whereas a teenage stem cell can self-renew about 200,000 times, a 40-year-old stem cell about 1,000 times, and an 80-year-old stem cell can self-renew about four times. So it's a steep drop-off. This is the reason younger people are preferred as bone marrow transplant donors for cancer treatments. Most donor programs target 16 to 30 year olds and do not even allow donors past age 60 because their stem cells don't help very much. The ratio of mar marrow cells to stem cells as we age shows us two things. First, that the repair burden for each stem cell increases with age. So for example, a newborn here, for every one stem cell in the bone marrow, there are 10,000 other cells that that stem cell needs to take care of. And then as we age, you can see as we become eight older, like 80 years old, each one stem cell needs to take care of 2 million other stem cells, or I'm sorry, other bone marrow cells. So each cell has a lot more work to do. And then secondly, this also shows us that we get drastically fewer stem cells from harvesting our own bone marrow as we age. So not only are, these, are there less stem cells as we age in our tissues, but the stem cells repair speeds slow with age as well. For example, the average doubling time for a placenta or cord stem cell is about 24 hours. And if you take stem cells from a 35-year-old, the average doubling time is about 48 hours. And if you take stem cells from a 65-year-old, the average doubling time is 60 hours. And the difference in doubling times may not sound that significant when you look at the hours. But because the doubling is exponential and not linear, small differences in doubling times accumulate quickly. For example, after one month, one single placenta or cord stem cell can grow to 1 billion cells on average. In a 35-year-old, one stem cell will yield 32,000 stem cells, and in a 65-year-old, one stem cell will grow only to about 200 cells. And it's important to have cells that can double lots of times because the more they can double, the more work they can do. So recently, a decrease in stem cell function has been shown to play a primary role in the cause of tissue aging and multiple diseases, such as anemia, sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle tissue commonly associated with age, and osteoporosis, suggesting at least in part that the cause of these diseases is an imbalance between cell loss 
and cell renewal. So our number of circulating and functioning stem cells determines whether our bodies are regenerating or degenerating. Without the necessary number of stem cells, the axis is tilted in the favor of degeneration. So if you have, if you need 10,000 stem cells to repair something like a knee problem, and you only have 200 stem cells in that area, then you simply have a math problem. Thus, not all stem cells are equal. Even though you can get your, harvest your own stem cells from your bone marrow or your adipose tissue or fat tissue, the therapeutic results will be significantly less the older you are. Young cells simply multiply faster. So if you're trying to get ahead of something, using younger, faster cells can help you get ahead of it more quickly. <coughs> Also, harvesting your own stem cells, either from fat or bone, are invasive procedures. I've had this performed myself. It's no picnic. I would much rather open a vial and inject stem cells that way. So, since also the stem cells age is one of the most significant things for determining the stem cells dividing and healing potential, the young stem cells from the placenta cord or cord blood are what we typically recommend here. These are the most robust human cells, stem cells available. And to clarify, right, we're not talking about embryonic, we're not talking about fetal, so there's no lives being taken to undergo these therapies. We use placenta, umbilical cord, and cord blood-derived stem cells since these tissues come from the afterbirth of healthy pregnancies, which were previously just medical wastes, so there's no ethical or legal problems using these stem cells. The stem cells come from healthy mothers that donate their placenta cord and cord blood. And the mothers undergo rigorous testing for any viral infectious diseases. And then the stem cells themselves are tested for infectious diseases and sterility. Only about one in 10 placentas and cords actually pass these stringent tests. So the tissues that pass testing are then sent to FDA regulated labs for processing and concentration of stem cells and other cellular growth factors. So we use multiple labs depending on the specific tissue types and the growth factors needed for different conditions that we treat or combinations of tissue types or of placenta cord and cord blood stem cells. So due to the fact that stem cells are tissue products and not drugs, the FDA cannot approve or disapprove them. Stem cells and related tissue products are considered experimental but it is the FDA's responsibility to make certain that they're safe for people receiving treatments. In these FDA regulated labs, the tissues are converted to different flowable states, depending on whether you want to use it for IV or for a local injection. A common question that I hear about stem cells, tissues, and growth factor therapies is, what if these therapies are too new to know if they will cause adverse effects later down the line, like cancer 10 to 20 years later. Human placenta tissues have been in clinical literature since 1910, an ample time to demonstrate the safety of their use for healing. This is uh, from a book published in 1910 of Johns Hopkins Hospital Reports. Successful tissue healing has been demonstrated with both fresh and placental tissues because of the growth factors present. So using placenta tissues for healing has been done and documented for over a century. 1913, placenta tissues, that's where amniotic membranes come from, were used and recommended for skin burns and ulcers instead of skin grafts. In 1950, this doctor wrote about the remarkable success of healing uh, using placenta tissues for ulcers since 1939. Chronic ulcers on the legs and elderly people are notoriously difficult to treat. In this particular uh, set of cases, he had bedridden patients that were aged from 60 to 80 who had ulcers from anywhere from 4 to 15 years that wouldn't heal. And when he added the placenta tissues, he showed that they healed with all of them within 10 weeks. The doctor wrote, the placenta tissue possesses some specific healing power, but at the time, right, we didn't know about stem cells explain it. Placenta was used and recommended to be adopted by any hospital regardless of its available facilities to treat skin burns in 1979 because it is simple and superior to other grafts. 
Placenta tissue was successfully used and recommended for chronic leg ulcers in 1980, once again because of the treatment's superiority. This study objectively shows what these doctors had been witnessing for over the last century when they claimed that the placenta tissue treatments were superior for healing. So these doctors compared using placenta tissue or a bioengineered skin substitute for diabetic, or I'm sorry, or standard of care for diabetic ulcers that were open for at least four weeks and not healing. And the standard of care here was defined as basically debridement or removal of dead tissue and then a topically applied uh, ointment or gel that actually stimulated collagen growth. Here are the results. After six weeks, 95% of the patients with the placenta membrane tissue dressings achieved complete wound closure, whereas 45% of the skin substitute group achieved complete wound closure, and only 35% of the standard care group achieved complete wound closure. More impressively though, the placenta dressing group had healed to closure on average in 13 days, whereas the other two groups healed on average after 49 days. And the average cost of the grafts was $1,600 for the placenta group and over $9,000 for the skin substitute group because the average placenta patient only needed two grafts, whereas the skin substitute patients needed nine grafts on average to achieve closure. In January 2018, more than a century later, placenta tissues were touted as an ideal treatment for skin burns and ulcers. In 1940, placenta tissues were being used and recommended in scientific literature for repairing the eye after injuries like chemical burns and heat burns. From that point on, the use of placenta tissues in ophthalmology surgery catapulted. In 2012, there were over 45,000 applications used by ophthalmologists, including conjunctival reconstruction, burn treatment, glaucoma surgery, and wound healing. Without a doubt, the placenta tissues are being widely utilized in the field of ophthalmology. In 2018, placenta, placenta tissues are claimed to be a novel surgical treatment for chemical burns to the eye to promote healing, minimize pain, and restore visual acuity. Also, it is currently being used successfully to treat nerve-related eye pain, showing that a topical placenta application can actually heal deep tissues like nerve tissues, not just healing the surface tissues. Doctors also started making placenta tissue injections and using them for tendon and ligament problems. In this study, people with plantar fasciitis, which can be a challenging and frustrating condition for both patients and doctors since no single treatment is guaranteed to alleviate the pain, were given a local anesthetic injection and either a single placenta injection or saline. They had the patients in different treatment groups complete this hind foot questionnaire that scores the patient's pain and function before and after the treatments. And here, the higher the score, the better the patient feels. So after the first week, the placenta group had 34 point average improvement on that questionnaire where the anesthesia and saline group only had a two point improvement on average. And after eight weeks, the placenta group had 53 point average improvement on the questionnaire where the anesthesia and saline group had only 13 point improvement. In a similarly designed study, just to put this in perspective, corticosteroid injections given to people with plantar fasciitis only produced a 30 point increase. So as I said before, you can also get stem cells from bone marrow. Bone marrow transplants are most commonly performed for patients with certain cancers of the blood or bones, such as multiple myeloma or leukemia. These patients are typically treated with chemotherapy and radiation, which destroys their stem cells so after the treatment, they need a bone marrow transplant to restore their pool of bone marrow stem cells. In 1997 though, a landmark case was reported in a patient who had full multiple sclerosis or MS and cancer. A 46 year old woman with 29, history, 29 year history of multiple sclerosis had the following symptoms. She had a recurrent right optic neuritis, uh, episodic vertigo or dizziness, persisted left-sided sensory abnormalities. She couldn't feel her left arm or leg. She also had progressive decline in motor skills, balance, and memory. And then on the left, her MRI shows an enhanced periventricular lesion here, um, correlated with the disease activity of multiple sclerosis. And then on the right, there's increased signal in the periventricle, periventricle white matter and again, these represent areas of active or chronic 
demyelination of the nerves, which is characteristic of MS, which is like that rubber coating on like you see on a wire, that natural fat layer that wraps around nerves, that starts to go away. So she was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer in a chronic phase and underwent a high dose chemotherapy and had a bone marrow transplant from her brother. After the bone marrow transplant, not only did she have no MS symptoms that flared up, but many things that she had had for years improved. After four months, her eye movements and the left-sided sensory deficits improved on her neurological examination. After 12 months, her memory, thought processes, and organization improved, as did many more neurological tests. Specifically, her hyper reflexes, eye movements, and sensation in her left eye and leg normalized. The only thing that didn't normalize was that her nerve on her right side in her eye looked a little pale still and did not change. But functionally, everything did. 12 months after the bone marrow transplant, the enhanced periventricular lesion here before had resolved, but these stable ones on the other side did not. But there were no new lesions after the bone marrow transplant. So in summary, after 12 months of a bone marrow transplant, her cancer was in remission. She was off all immunosuppressive medications, her MS symptoms improved, and her neurological exam was functionally normal. This case spurred other doctors to try stem cells primarily for MS. By 2013, doctors had learned a lot about stem cells for MS and wrote, stem cells have been shown to reduce or eliminate ongoing clinical relapses, halt further progression, and reduce the burden of disability in some patients uh, in the absence of chronic treatment with disease-modifying agents. By 2017, there were more than 750 stem cell transplants primarily for MS that had been reported in the medical literature. Here are the pooled results of the acceptable studies. NEDA stands for no evidence of disease activity, and they showed that basically after the two year mark, 83% of patients receiving a stem cell uh, or bone marrow transplant had 83% of no disease activity. And after five years, 67% had no evidence of disease activity. So that mean it went up? That some of them went back up? Correct. Over time, some of them had gotten the disease again or sent or signs of it. Yeah. But the others were looked like in complete remission. So evidence indicates that the largest benefit risk profile from blood-derived stem cells can be obtained in patients with aggressive MS, with relapsing, remitting, coarse, and who have not yet accumulated a high level of disability. But researchers showed that placenta stem cells have more immunomodulating effects compared to cord stem cells. So since MS typically involves a dysfunctioning immune system, it would make sense to try placenta stem cells for MS. And that's what researchers did. They started the process of studying placenta stem cells for MS by first conducting the safety trial. The highlights were a preclinical -clin pre model suggests that Placenta stem cells may lead to immunomodulation and repair in MS, and that placenta stem cell infusion appears to be safe and well tolerated in patients with MS, and there was no paradoxical worsening of MS lesion counts. So as in most phase one trials, though, unfortunately this study was not designed to determine the treatment's effectiveness. A clinical trial is planned to further explore the safety, feasibility, and dosing, and the potential benefits of this approach. So dosing, do you mean that they'd have to have continual stem cell? Yes, or possibly they change the number of stem cells they give each patient and they compare who got the best results. So in humans, the first trial for stem cells for osteoarthritis was in a male with severe knee osteoarthritis in 2008, and he showed improved pain, walking distance, and joint space width on MRI. Since then, many studies have been performed and 11 were accepted and reviewed. All three studies on osteoarthritis and eight on cartilage defects reported good to excellent overall outcomes with the use of stem cell therapies. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic inflammatory disorder affecting many joints, including those in the hands and feet. In 2010, there was another impressive 
case report published on rheumatoid arthritis. They had a 67-year-old woman with rheumatoid arthritis who had severe pain and swelling in her fingers, both ankles and knees. She had difficulty walking even short distances, which were limited by pain and stiffness, uh, stiffness in hands, especially upon rising, which is notorious for rheumatoid arthritis. And it was pro she had progressively worsening fatigue, excess sleeping, redness of both hands. Her labs revealed a rheumatoid factor that was elevated at 75, whereas the normal range goes up to 39. And her CCP antibodies were greater than 250, where the normal range is less than 25. So she had two fat-derived or adipose tissue-derived stem cell IVs in two days. She had, first, no side effects. And on day two, she had considerable resolution of her joint pain and stiffness. Day three, she was walking normally with no pain or symptoms. And after 15 months, she trains daily with a personal trainer without limitations. And her lab values also showed some improvement from her rheumatoid factor from 75 to 51 and her CCP antibodies from greater than 250 to just greater than 100. In veterinary medicine, stem cell therapy is an accepted therapeutic modality for degenerative conditions with a reported 80% improvement. So over 4,000 horses and 4,000 dogs have been successfully treated and documented in the medical literature. In this study, 172 patients with active rheumatoid arthritis who had inadequate responses to traditional medicine were enrolled in to test stem cell therapy. So group one served as the control group and they stayed on their disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, also known as DMARDs, with no significant changes occurring. Then the second group was they took people and had them stay on their DMARDs, but they also gave them IV stem cells and it induced a significant remission according to the disease, uh, excuse me, of the disease, according to the American College of Rheumatology Improvement Criteria, the 28 Joint Activity Score and the Health Assessment Questionnaire. And what's also interesting is that the effects maintained for three to six months without continuous administration. And no serious adverse effects were observed and the level of tumor necrosis factor also, and interleukin-6 also decreased. The percentage of regulatory T cells increased and some patients were given a second stem cell IV and were shown to have even a more enhanced therapeutic effect. So their conclusion on this study was DMARDs plus umbilical stem cells may provide safe, significant, and persistent clinical benefits for patients with active rheumatoid arthritis. So the old stem cell model was that stem cells could regenerate tissue, which that's how they help heal ulcers. They can repair tissue, which helps, and also re, uh, prevent premature cell death, which helps burns. They can also reduce scarring. But now we know that they help MS, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. And the question is, well, how do they do that? Because the other one makes more sense that they're actually creating new tissue. And the answer is because all of these conditions have a common thread, inflammation. So autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disorder that impairs the ability to communicate and interact. Another milestone article was published in 2005 which studied the brain tissues and cerebral spinal fluid from autistic patients. It showed autistic patients have an active neuroinflammatory process in the cerebral cortex. Uh, white matter and notably the cerebellum, suggesting that future therapies might involve modifying the inflammatory neuroglial responses in the brain. And then in 2011, researchers found that autistic children also have more systemic inflammation than non-autistic children, specifically higher inflammatory cytokines in their blood, which may reflect a dysfunctional immune system. In 2013, different researchers also found that autistic children have more inflammation than non-autistic children in regards to inflammatory markers in their blood. And also, these markers are produced locally in inflamed tissues, and it seemed to correlate with the degree and severity of autism. Because stem cells were shown to reduce inflammation and modulate the immune system, doctors decided to give stem cells to a boy with autism and he had a positive benefit. They used a boy's own bone marrow stem cells. He had no significant side effects to the treatment and noticed slight improvements in one week, such as eye contact, a 
attention, handwriting, and fine motor skills like buttoning a shirt, but there were significant improvements from eight to 12 months. So after six months, aggression and activities and hyperactivity reduced 45 to 50%, improvements in impulse control, reading skills, tracing, recognition of all shapes, and following commands were noted. His scores on the CARS or the Childhood Autism Rating Scale reduced from 42, which is a rating of being severely autistic, to 23.5, which is actually just barely under the mild non-autistic threshold, although the doctor said he was clinically still assessed as mildly autistic. The treatment also showed that there were enhanced PET scan brain function after the treatment. So these are the pre and post, pre on top, post on the bottom, uh, PET scans of his brain. The metabolic activity indicated by more lit up areas of the brain improved on all the views, uh, sagittal, transverse, and coronal. So after one year, his peer activity increased significantly, new tasks, new learning tasks, and uh, improved, which was noted due to increased participation in household work. His comprehension of ability to follow commands had improved significantly, and he had developed self-insight and an appropriate emotional response. The author's conclusions were all these improvements have led to the improved quality of life for the patient as well as the family, and that several incurable neurological disorders have shown benefits with cellular therapy, and autism should be explored as an indication. So later that same year, a clinical trial for treating autism was carried out using three different rehab groups. One, they did a conventional rehab with cord blood mononuclear cells, which contain stem cells. And the second group had the rehab, cord blood, and mono, uh, cord blood mononuclear cells, and umbilical cord stem cells. And then the third group was to act as a control group, which just had the conventional rehab. There were 37 autistic patients, age three to 12. They had four stem cell infusions on average of about every five to seven days. They had a 24 week follow-up and no major adverse effects had occurred. Just to give you an idea, five people, five of the kids had developed a low grade fever. So compared to the control group, both objective, functional and subjective improvements were observed in visual, emotional and intellectual responses, body use, adaptation to change, fear and nervousness, nonverbal communication, activity level, uh, social withdrawal or lethargy, stereotypic behavior, hyperactivity, and inappropriate speech. So the conclusions were the transplantation of cord blood, mononuclear cells demonstrated efficacy, however, compared to the uh, combination group, combination group showed larger therapeutic effects. In 2017, there were 10 clinical trials registered for using stem cells to treat autism. So for a long time, autism or uh, ASD's autistic spectrum disorders were not considered a physiological disease. ASD's were more considered a social or emotional disorder. And due to this reason, few physiological treatments were even suggested for ASD children and almost all treatments were behavioral or educational. A broad range of biochemical, toxicological, and immune processes are impacted in ASD. These include oxidative stress, endoplasmic reticulum stress, decreased methylation capacity, limited production of glutathione, mitochondrial dysfunction, intestinal dysbiosis, increased toxic metal burden, and immune dysregulation, including autoimmunity. Stem cell therapy for ASD is definitely going mainstream. In the 2017 textbook, Neurological Regeneration, there is an entire chapter dedicated to stem cell therapy for autism. And it shows the kinds of cells uh, or stem cells used to date are mononuclear cells from the bone marrow, umbilical cord, blood, fetal stem cells, or mesenchymal stem cells from, or again, adult stem cells from umbilical cord itself. And the authors conclude transplantation of these cells significantly improve some scores in autistic patients. Dr. Reardon, who is a major pioneer in stem cell therapy, inoculated a petri dish of stem cells with Staphylococcus bacteria, a commonly known bacteria for, most people know it as a staph infection, right? You get it on the skin or in the nasal cavity. And he found that the 
stem cell in the center when it was inoculated, that petri dish was inoculated with the bacteria, it produces a zone of inhibition and that those stem cells are actually protected from the bacteria. In 2008, doctors from Russia treated 27 patients with untreatable drug resistance tuberculosis or TB with stem cells. Every patient experienced a positive clinical benefit. In 20 patients, bacterial discharge stopped after three to four months and these patients were no longer drug resistant. In nine of the 16 patients that were continued to follow for, uh, excuse me, continued to be followed for one and a half to two years, remission of the tuberculosis occurred. The lead doctor was asked about his rationale for using stem cells in these patients, and he said, when I have nothing else, I give MSCs, right? And those are kind of stem cells. So many chronic lung conditions have been found to be inflammatory conditions. And because stem cells are anti-inflammatory, it has been proposed that stem cells can help these lung conditions as well, such as acute lung injury, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, and pulmonary hypertension. In 2013, a phase one clinical trial of bone marrow mononuclear cells was reported in four patients with advanced pulmonary emphysema who had been given one IV treatment and followed for three years after the procedure. The inclusion criteria of these participants included severe COPD, clinical treatments ineffective previously, limited life expectancy, and limitation in daily physical activities. So in other words, these were pretty sick people. The results. The treatment was safe with no adverse effects and improvements were observed in laboratory parameters such as spirometry, which is the actual measurement of how much air you can inhale, exhale, and how quickly. The process of pathological degeneration was slowed down. The clinical condition improved and the quality of life improved. The conclusions. The results opened new therapeutic perspectives in COPD. Stem cells can change the natural history of COPD, which typically gets progressively worse, uh, and other therapeutic options are limited. And studies with larger number of patients are warranted. So the potential for stem cells for treatment of lung conditions has been well documented, and here are just some of the ongoing clinical trials to date. The process of stem cell-based repair involves homing. Homing is migration of stem cells into other tissues, including bone marrow, blood vessels, and organs within the body in response to a stress stimuli such as drugs, irradiation, ischemia, or uh, inadequate blood flow. Homing is a rapid process, uh, usually lasting two to 48 hours, and it's not selective, which means that the stem cells can go to any cells that are expressing distress signals. So in this study, researchers infused stem cells, IV in mice, via the tail, and tracked where the stem cells went in three different conditions. The first condition was a sham or a control condition where no surgery was performed. Second, they cracked the sternum of the mouse, and then the third condition was they cracked the sternum and then also cut an artery to the heart, causing a myocardial infarction or an actual heart attack. And you can see that the stem cells in the second condition went only to the sternum, whereas the stem cells in the third condition dispersed over the entire heart area. So the study showed that stem cells home mostly to areas of, of tissue injury and inflammation. Stem cells home to the cells that are secreting the most distress signals in a dose-dependent manner. Stem cells naturally travel IV to home to distant areas of damage. So efficiency of homing is defined as the number of cells given that successfully go into the target tissue. So the efficacy, or I'm sorry, the efficiency of homing in stem cell treatments depends on many factors, including how many cells have been manipulated and how you administer the cells. And so stem cells given IV have a high homing efficiency because the circulatory system delivers oxygen and nutrients to every cell in the body and stem cells given IV have a high probability to reach any damaged or inflamed tissues that you have. Research has shown that the most stem cell treatments do not result in growing new organs, but hang around for four to 12 months, repairing existing cells and reducing inflammation. 
This is the reason we offer this treatment here. In this study, researchers measured first the number of circulating progenitor cells or EPCs, which are an intermediate stem cell committed to differentiating along a particular cell developmental pathway. And second, the number of deaths from cardiovascular diseases. The cumulative evident event-free survival increased in a stepwise fashion across increasing levels of baseline EPCs. And if a person had an event, cardiovascular event, such as a myocardial infraction, or they had a heart surgery to prevent a problem, to do more revascularization, more circulating EPCs reduced their risk of death. In this study, doctors followed people who had strokes and divided them into two groups, people with high circulating stem cells and people with low circulating stem cells. They compared the severity of symptoms after one in three months, and the higher the column, the worse the symptoms. So following a stroke, individuals with higher, the higher content of circulating stem cells, they recovered better than the individuals with fewer circulating stem cells shown by these higher symptom columns in one in three months after a stroke. So with the importance of circulating stem cells, researchers asked the question, do any foods help nourish and stimulate stem cells? Out of many natural compounds shown in the literature, items that were candidates were tested in the lab and the best performing items were combined and tested looking for some sort of synergistic combination. Surprisingly, fermenting the best performing natural compounds increased the effect of nourishing and stimulating the stem cells fivefold after being proven in the lab. It was used in a clinical trial. So they had 18 adults ages 20 to 72 and they showed there was a 100% increase in the circulating endothelial progenitor cells, or those EPCs, there was a 90% increase in CD133 stem cells, 53% increase in CD34 stem cells, and overall 40 to 50 increase in your blood cell line forming stem cells. So the supplement conclusion is that stem cell treatments are only part of the story. And these supplements were shown to be effective with or without stem cell treatments. So even if you haven't had a stem cell treatment, you can take these supplements and increase your own circulating level of stem cells. The product that they developed was called Stemkine, and it's got lactobacillus, goji berry, green tea, astrologus uh, root, and beta-1,3 glycan, and the antioxidant, elegiac acid, and vitamin D3. They used kine because it's a suffix meaning to move, motion, or division. So that's how they came up with the stem kind name. So the scientific literature shows many chronic conditions improve with bone marrow or fat derived stem cells from the same person. But we see superiority in using young stem cells. So it brings up the question, is using someone else's stem cells safe? Researchers have found that 100% of mothers have stem cells from every baby they have carried for up to 50 years in their blood and tissues. The increased stem cells are the proposed reason for mothers living longer than non-mothers. And although it was shown that mothers live longer, it was also thought that mothers may have more autoimmune disease risk because of these circulating fetal stem cells. Mothers live about a third year longer for each child up to 14 years. And something happens after 14 children and they don't live longer. And I think it just might be stressful at that point. <laughs> so it just sounds overwhelming to me. So I, I guess stem cells can't fix everything. But since the fetal stem cells are found in mother's diseased or injured tissues, it was originally thought that they may induce the autoimmune problems or diseases. However, a report of a severe graft versus host disease successfully treated with transplanted stem cells supported the opposite hypothesis. The doctors wrote, the clinical response was striking. The patient is now well after one year, and we postulate that mesenchymal stem cells, or again, adult stem cells, have a, potent, have a potent immunosuppressive effect in vivo or in real life. So again, the fetal stem cells are found in diseased or injured maternal tissue, and it was thought that these cells triggered the disease, like those autoimmune diseases, but the clinical data suggests that the cells are actually more likely helping the condition. So just like mothers benefit from their baby's stem cells, 
Transplanted placenta, cord, or cord blood stem cells can reduce inflammation and modulate the immune system in addition to helping many conditions that require new tissue gener regeneration. So before a baby is born, the placenta and umbilical cord is the lifeline. But after a baby is born, that lifeline can give birth to the hope for others suffering with chronic conditions. 